Hey guys, welcome to the show. This is Popeye. It's down the rabbit hole. Today I have a special guest. Her name is Judith Barry Baker. You've all heard me talk about her many times. She is the real deal. She is 100% accurate with what she says. And her story doesn't get the airtime or the attention that it needs. And neither does the truth about Lee Harvey Oswald. So today, we're going to get into the truth, and we're going to, you're going to get to hear Judah's story and the stuff that the media doesn't tell you about Lee. They try to make him a monster, but in all reality, Lee Oswald was not a monster. He was a really average, everyday person just like you and me, and he had a big heart, and he was really a good person. And that's the side of Lee Oswald that I want everybody to get to know. So without further ado, Judith, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Well, I appreciate it, Popeye, and it's because it's you that it's happening. Well, you you are an amazing person, and I, I, I just, you know, I know that you, this really is uh, – you can't do this. You can't do interviews on the, you know, normally because your life has been put in danger because of the information that you have come forth with. So I, I appreciate that you you taking, you know, personal risk to speak to the audience and get your story and Lee's story out today. It, you have courage, and you are uh, you are an example of what the people in this country should do. They, you know, you, you you give you give me hope. So and you give me, you know, it's it's nice to see that people go through, you know, hell and still have the courage to stand up and speak truth to power. So you you deserve a big thumbs up and, you know, a, a collective clap from the entire country for what you're doing. Well, I think that all started when I heard that Abraham Lincoln walked several miles to return a tiny bit of money. And it, it, that kind of thing has always been my hero. Just, you have to do what's right. Exactly. And what's right in this case, is getting your story out and the truth about Lee out. Um, you tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you got to meet Lee in New Orleans and, and kind of how you got to New Orleans. I understand how you got there. Um, and you, for the listeners, you have to check out Judah's book. It's called Me and Lee. You can go see it at meandlee.com. And please purchase the book. I, 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 like I said before on other shows, it's very important to get books and manuscripts and stuff like that because you are preserving history, and this is a definite piece of history that needs to be preserved. So uh, go ahead, Judith. Well, meeting Lee Oswald, I had no idea or concept, of course, of his existence or his, what, how important he would be in my life or anything like that. I was asked to come to New Orleans to assist uh, in um, – Mary Sherman, Dr. Mary Sherman, and cancer research uh, work that she was doing. I was. Uh, my book explains the very complex uh, reasons why I went to New Orleans, and the fact that I had a a man in my life who was very interesting to me. And I thought I had lost my faith at that time in God. Thank God that that has been restored. Uh, I didn't believe that marriage was more than just a piece of paper, but you couldn't get birth control pills without it. Uh, this man had said, uh, he, you know, if I uh, would accept him, you know, and he would come and meet me in New Orleans and marry me. So I had a real exciting summer coming up and spring. And I arrived in April of 1963 in New Orleans, and it, it was a culture shock because being alone wasn't so bad. But Dr. Auctioner, who had invited me, and Dr. Mary Sherman, they were out of town because I had come two weeks early. There had been a miscommunication because my university got out, was on a trimester system that got out early. And I had nowhere to go and I didn't want to go home. If you read the book, you'll see why. So I, when I arrived, uh, I, I, being someone who was uh, highly educated in certain areas and pretty much a dum-dum when it came to adjusting to a life um, in a place like New Orleans, I, I was really at a loss. And sooner, uh, sooner than later, I would have gotten myself into problems. Suddenly, this young man shows it up. I'm at the post office, and um, I dropped something and briefly. And uh, when he picked it up, I thanked him in Russian in a 
crude manner of speaking. Uh, I didn't know much Russian, but I liked to, at that time, use whatever language was in my head. So I did that, and he answered me in Russian, said it wasn't a good idea to speak Russian in New Orleans. I was shocked. I mean, I never met anybody who, who knew Russian, you know, and I was fascinated by the Russian culture. I, I'd read all the Russian masters. I was also very good in chess. And uh, lo and behold, this man was the same. He, he was a good chess player. Not only had, did he know Russian, and he knew all these wonderful uh, operas, and by heart he knew the Queen of Spades opera, for example, by heart. He'd read Dostoevsky and Pushkin and so on. Not only that, he'd lived in Russia. Can you imagine how I felt when I found out this man had lived in the USSR for almost three years? It didn't take a long period of time before I realized how very much I was attracted to him and what kind of a man he was. He was a very interesting and sensitive person uh, and a very brave man. He frankly ended up telling me that he was on a mission to try to kill Fidel Castro. He said I wasn't, he, when I uh, asked him uh, why he learned so many things about uh, Castro and about Cuba, he could rattle off he loved maps, and he he could rattle off every bit of Cuba from one end to the other, and all the rivers, and all the economic factors, and all of the leaders they had. And I asked him why he learned all that, and he said he was going to go to Cuba. I said why, and he said, well, he wasn't going to, there to give Castro a medal. So I understood immediately, of course, that he was what he was involved in, considering everything else he told me. That was intriguing. I realized I was speaking to someone who had been a spy in Russia and in the USSR. So anyway, that's basically how we met. And once you once you met him, he's the the, the guy that introduced you to um, David Ferry, correct? Uh, yeah. And uh, some of my enemies online, they they uh, I had approved. Uh, uh, one doctor's, uh, Dr. John Williams, is an outline of how all this happened, and he had placed a list of people under one day, uh, Ochsner and Ferry and so on. I didn't see them all that same day, but I certainly did see, meet Dr. David Ferry, so-called doctor, the day after Lee and I met in New Orleans. I met him on April 26th, and we're talking about April 27th, and uh, met him in the afternoon at a restaurant. That was quite an experience. Anybody who's ever seen Dave Ferry uh, would <clears throat> agree with me, <laughs> put it that way. Quite an outstanding person in many ways, brilliant man. Um, there, there's a biographer now, uh, you know, on the uh, Oswald Didditt side who contends that David Ferry wasn't an unusual man, but anybody who really knew Ferry would have had to disagree. This man never met Ferry, okay? So I, in fact, I'm writing a... Um, biographer David Ferry because I, I like him very much. Some people think, well, okay, he was a homosexual and he was a pedophile and all that. It's true that he had a real problem with um, teenage boys and there are a lot of people who condemn him for that. I, I look at the whole man, however, and see what else he was. He was a good patriot. He uh, pretended to dislike Kennedy. At one point, he, he really was... Uh, expressing hatred for Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs matter. But later, when he realized that it wasn't to Kennedy who was involved, that it was actually Nixon who had set up Bay of Pigs mess and so on, he realized what Kennedy had done. That changed everything for Ferry. And by the way, we have uh, Mary Sherman and David Ferry and me. So our joke was, you know, it was Dr. Mary, Dr. Ferry, and Dr. Ferry, <laughs> the three of us. Yes. Turned out they were working on a project, you know, to... Uh, try and um, create a, they've been working on it for a year, try and create a kind of a virus-laden cancer that would react quite rapidly when injected in someone's body. And uh, they would develop it to, um, because it had lung cancer and uh, it would create lung cancer rapidly. Uh, and the idea was to try and kill Castro with it without that way involving any country. Nobody could be blamed get rid of cast or using what looked like natural means. I would suspect today that a number of people who suddenly come up with cancer, like maybe Mr. Chavez, it may not be as um, normal or natural as it may look. 
you just answered uh, my question, my next question, without even me needing to ask it. Because I was about to ask you, do you think that these world leaders and truth tellers, people like Bill Hicks, Aaron Russo, all these other people that come out and start to tell the truth about you know reality and about yeah. the government, they all of a sudden always end up getting cancer. Dr. Catherine Albrecht, she talks about the RFID chips. All of a sudden, she gets cancer. David Ray Griffin wrote like 10 books on 9-11. He was sick. And I think it was cancer. So do you think that the research that you guys were working on is being used today in a weaponized form? Well, as you know, I left that project due to, to my concerns, my ethical concerns, and uh, before that, they blackballed me forever from being in cancer research. So I cannot determine precisely when or where the materials went after that, <laughs> except I know that some of them went to MD Anderson Hospital in Texas. We have um, later somebody filing a lawsuit that someone had tried to or injected them with cancer cells. Uh, ordinarily, this should not be any problem. The body would uh, take a cancer cell and destroy it in short order and filter it out and destroy it. Uh, you'd have to be injected with a lot of ordinary cancer cells in order to make a difference. But when you see a lawsuit that's been placed against someone, <laughs> you know, because uh, someone else injected them with cancer cells, you have to wonder if those were the same kind. These cells were un very unusual in six or seven days. Uh, they, if you inject, injected them into a, in a compromised immune system, such as a newborn baby mouse, the tumors that would generate on that mouse would uh, be the same weight as the mouse itself in a week. So that's how fast it could grow. And they would take this and um, the biggest tumors, the most vigorous ones, and they put them through, run them through again, and. Uh, put radiation on them and so on. And again, any tumors that grew even faster, those would be selected. That would be going on for a year. So you can imagine what we have today. We're talking, that was back in the 60s. Yeah, so, you know, fast forward 40 years, I can only imagine what you they've know, got today. You, you have no concept of what they have today and the genetic manipulations and so on. I'll just put it this way. I, wouldn't, I would not accept a vaccine for anything especially if I were a controversial person. Yeah, I don't do vaccines. I, I, when I was in the military, I personally had my own experience with vaccines. After give, getting all the vaccines at boot camp, I developed Bell's palsy in the left side of my yeah. face for three months, and I still have residual side effects from it. So I, I don't play with vaccines at all. I don't do the flu shot. I don't do any of that crap. Yeah, well, I think that uh, that's why some people say it's not being fair that the rest of the population is taking all these risks so that you don't get the disease. But there are other ways to conquer these diseases. Most of them can be conquered, for example, with bacteriophage. You can't get TB if you have a really good bacteriophage fighting it. The bacteriophage, you know, is used in sewage plants and so on. I mean, we have horrible diseases that go into sewage plants. Out comes nice, fresh, clean water. How do you think that happens? By miracles? It's not just chemicals. They use bacteriophage. It, it, see, this is the stuff I'm talking about. It's like when they, they use uh, the Italian guy. He's been using baking soda treatments, this Italian doctor, and he was able to clean out uh, cancer out of um, the, the videos I saw. It was sinus, like ca the guy had sinus cavities. <clears throat> He had polyps yeah. all throughout his sinus cavities. Well, and they were basically, it there are a dozen. Yeah, there are dozens of ways that cancer can be cured. Various different kinds of cancer. There are so many out there. But uh, and I was just mentioning one particular way to handle it. There are a number of various therapies out there. But the problem is, the traditional way is the way that makes money. You have huge um, industries built around, you know, the radiation units. I'll think of all the people that'd be out of business if they didn't use radiation on cancer anymore, even though radiation actually causes cancer, and you know if you get too much exposure to it. And then you have, um, on top of that, you have all these very expensive uh, chemotherapy regimens that you can go through. Uh, by the way, the it's abysmal that uh, the so-called cure rate. There are very, very few chemotherapy regimens that actually work. Very few. Uh, they also fudge the statistics quite a bit. Like in the United States, if you're free of cancer for five years, you know, you're, they consider that a cure. In some other countries, it's 10 years. But then they, they, you don't, so you don't realize really, I mean, if you have someone who 
in year six gets cancer again, and, you know, they, they count that as a new recurrence when it could be the old one returning. But the statistics look good, you know, if you just say after five years cancer-free, you're cured. There you have a huge industry, and they make billions. And why in the world would they want to change things and actually cure cancer when they make so much money off cancer? It has now become the number one killer, passing heart disease, okay, statistically. And it's going to get worse and worse. A lot of cancer, of course, is caused by a virus, various viruses. And they don't want people knowing that. You, how would you like to take care of somebody that you're knowing that 20 years from now you may get cancer because you took care of someone whose cancer was caused by a virus that lays latent in your system? And to show that viruses can lay latent in your system, a lot of people who have had chicken pox when they get much older, they end up getting, as you know, shingles. And that's just a recurrence of chicken pox in a different form later. And then things laid latent in your system for 20, 30, maybe 40 years. It's it's incredible the the research and stuff that they have done with like biological weapons and and such things. It's it's just incredible. I mean, and, oh, and you you'll never know the the extent of this course, you know. And if we if we know about it, that means that that's the 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 only the small part, you know. <laughs> it's what well, we you don't have, know. Well, you have Richard Nixon. He he knows what's going on. He knew about all this and. And uh, he declares a war on cancer and gets collects all this stuff over at Fort Detrick. Every single way, uh, every single thing that was being done to cure cancer ended at Fort Detrick, and then you never hear about it again. It it and look at the the anthrax. You know they you get the guy oh it's some crazy some just some crazy lone nut here we go with the lone nut thing again and it's very it's al- convenient it's always the same thing and his family and friends have come out and said no you're demonizing him and making him out to be a bad guy and you know it's the same it's like we were talking earlier it's the same template they don't change they have this playbook they're not they- they're not particularly bright as uh, i think we've mentioned before they're simply uh Average intelligence, um, those who really understand the uh, what's really going on, it, it's almost laughable to see how the average American person, unfortunately, is kept unaware of most of uh, the evils that are being done. It's destroying our country. I, it's breaking my heart to see what America has become. We don't, we don't have job security. We have a lot of homeless. We have people. The country's going backwards, and. Um, because of greed, corruption, and evil, and people being taught to only care for themselves. We've got to care for each other. We've got, we've got to care for each other, and we've got to have get our standards back. Well, see, that, that, that segues right back into my next question here, which would, or <clears throat> not so much um, a question, but um, Lee was not this monster that they made him out to be. And it's important that the listeners get to hear the human side of him. Is there anything specific or special that you want to share with the listening audience? Oh, absolutely. Of course. Uh, For example, if you look at the Robert Groden, who's a fine man, look at his collection, uh, The Search for Lee Harvey Oswald, you look at those pictures, and and every one of Lee is either with someone or, you know, maybe a separate picture. If If you cut out all those arrest photos... A lot of them, by the way, have been apparently altered. You see smirks that he never had in real life. I saw that uh, they show him. But uh, I look and, and I said, look, uh, to Dr. Howard Platzman, look, he's smiling in almost every photo. He's always with people, people with their arms around him. He's got his arms around them. This is the lone nut who's supposed to be like, you know, antisocial and so on. It's a lie. It's an absolute lie. You can see it in Groden's book easily. As for who Lee really was, he, he was an ordinary human being as far as what he was doing, but he was deeply impressed by Herbert Philbrick of uh, I Led Three Lives, who who posed as uh, as a communist for the FBI. He infiltrated a couple of communist cells, and uh, they made picture, uh, you know, uh, films about it that were on television, a television series. Lee saw that, saw those when he was 12 and 13, I believe he was 13 years old, in New York. And he told me he got on his knees and started to cry. He said, I just want to help my country. I want to be like him. He, he 
absolutely adored Herbert Selbrick. So this is the young man who is supposed to be communist. And, or, and they always say things like communist. He never actually even joined the Communist Party when he was even in the USSR. He did not do it. In this interactive timeline, which is a gross um, caricature, actually, of who Leah Harvey Oswald really was that's online, there are many things missing. For example, they said that uh, uh, when Lee was uh, in... Um, got himself, uh, bought a rifle, you know, bought a gun, I should say, and so and joined a, his, uh, this group, let's see, where was he, he was, uh, trying to think where that was, anyway, this was a gun club, and Lee was invited to come out and shoot, he couldn't shoot a thing, I mean, he was so bad, they shot a rabbit for him, so he'd have something to bring home. This is a sharpshooter who's supposed to have killed Kennedy. By the way, killed Kennedy with no motive, says he didn't do it. Passed a voice stress analysis test that says he didn't do it. By the way, also these people will bring up the voice stress analysis test and say, but on the part where it says, I don't know anything, he didn't pass that. Well, of course, because he knew that the assassination was going to happen. He did everything in his power to stop it. Lee cared about his country, and he posed as a uh, uh, someone who, you know, was an ordinary person to get into the USSR to report back to the United States, and he did so. Uh, he had information that he gave back, which is never mentioned. You don't see a thing in this interactive timeline of the life of Lee Harvey Oswald, for example, that he actually uh, interviewed Gary Powers over in, in uh, the USSR, and that uh, he gave information, threatened to give information, that to the extent that about the U-2 that they had to change all the codes. So he had a cryptic clearance. They don't mention that either. He had a higher uh, security clearance than his commanding officer did. None of that comes out, you know. Yeah, they never, talk, have, they never yeah. really talk about the, the facts behind, uh, you know, Lee and the stuff that is the truth. The only thing they ever put out is that he's some, you know, little skinny, you know, Lone nut type wink, guy, yeah. yeah. And which, and if you look at his background, you know, I used to, I, I had heard the whole, you know, Lee Oswald was a, 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 a crappy marine. He was this and that and everything else that they put out. And when I actually looked into it, it's quite the opposite. So I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you, Judith. Go right ahead. Oh no, I, I appreciate hearing your input. You're a young person. You've got to keep the truth going. You know, and thank God for you. I'll tell you that right now. If anyone who had actually known Lee got to know him, when he was arrested, what does he have on his hand? He has a marine ring on his hand, okay? They take that off right away, and in the Dallas police record, they don't mention it as a ring. They say silver marine. They don't mention the marine, that it's a R-I-N-G ring, okay? That only comes out when the FBI makes the list again, and then it says marine ring, okay? Now, what is the marine ring about? It says on it, you know, uh, the Marine Amato is always faithful. He had a problem when he was arrested. If he had said who he was, his contacts, he had told me this long ago, there are people that are, were other spies that were in the USSR, okay, and he was in contact with some of them. Had he said that he had been a spy or working with the CIA or FBI, those people would have died. His Courage goes further than a lot of people realize. He never felt sorry for himself. When, he, when they said, how'd you get hurt like that? Because they saw his black eye. and his, He said, a, a policeman hit me. The fact is he was beat up by several policemen at the same time, including being shoved in the back with a, with a gun at his back. You know, he was uh, punched in the stomach by McDonald who arrested him. And by the way, McDonald, you can find where he actually says that he approached, when he was in the theater, he comes to Lee Oswald and he has, he, McDonald, is carrying his revolver in his hand, you know. He's got it drawn. Now, how can he have this revolver drawn, hold, held in his right hand, and when he gets to Lee Oswald, somehow that revolver vanishes and Lee Oswald, he says he's reaching to, because, to Oswald's waist there to get the gun. Lee Oswald did nothing until he reached into the waist. I believe that what he tried to do is plant this gun on Lee Oswald. What did he do? Did he go and, and put his revolver back in his holster? 
and then go to Lee and uh, and uh, struggle with him to get the gun that Lee pulled, they say, out of his, you see what I'm saying? And you have all these eyewitnesses that say that Lee pulled it up in the air, but I think that thing was planted, Lee pulled it out of his, you know, up out away from him, and that's when he defended himself because he didn't want to have that thing planted on him. Well, I think that I I think that they were supposed to take him out in the movie theater. I don't think he was Absolutely. supposed to make it out of that theater alive. You know, Jack Ruby shooting him in the in the police station three days later or two days later was that was that was you know damage control. I think he was. I don't think Oswald was supposed to make it out of the movie theater alive. And I think for whatever, however they did it, I think Lee figured out what was up, the, and I think he was able to at least somewhat defend himself to not get shot somehow, and then. They, they, well, they, they, he was very wise. He cried out, you know, police brutality. I'm not resisting arrest and so on and so forth. Well, see, that's they probably what they're shooting. Life, right? You can't shoot somebody when they're saying that, you know. Well, so, nowadays, Judith, they just they would just do it anyway. But at least back then, the cops realized that they, they couldn't do it. So. And here, here you have Lee is in the theater. Uh, he's been seen buying popcorn at the time that Tippett's supposed to be been shot, okay? Then you have this a person who is pretending to be Lee Oswald running into the theater at the proper time without paying, which of course brings everybody in. And then you find out somebody's being re- removed through the back door by the police. That's seen by a witness. It looks like Lee Oswald, but it wasn't. It's an imposter. But Lee is moving from person to person. He sits next to at least six people in that theater. Why would he do that? Well, he told me that when he was in the USSR at Minsk, that he, he had to move to a certain seat in the theater there, and he picked up a message, you know, a contact message uh, that was taped under the seat. So I, my belief is that he thought he was supposed to sit next to contact. None of them, well, that was enough to keep him going there and in the theater until, uh, of course, they could catch him. It's very sad. And then, of uh, course, they, they beat the crap out of him in the police station, didn't give him any, uh, didn't afford him any, legal representation whatsoever. I mean, he even said so himself when he walked out and he had spoken to the, the news people. Oh, yeah. I mean, unbelievable. Can you imagine? And they said, oh, he didn't want anybody. Come on. He please. asked for it right on air. Yeah, of course he did. But they, they actually are on record saying that when he was arraigned for murders that he uh, didn't want a lawyer. Of course, we only have their word to prove for it. And by the way, half the things they say Lee said when he was under arrest, are reported by the police. We can't trust what they said. Did you know, uh, many people do not know this, you know how these lineups were. This is a fact that they would. They had six slots there where people, and they only filled up, as you know, uh, they didn't fill up all the slots. They, they only had three people, uh, and plus Lee, only four people. You have a 25% chance of, of, right there, of, you know, just by chance that you would say it was that person. But on top of that, Lee is in a torn shirt, you know, rumpled. He's got cut. He's exhausted. He's standing there with people who don't look anything like him. In two of the lineups, at least, he, I think maybe even three of those lineups, they used three office workers, okay, with the Dallas Police Department who were dressed in nice office clothes. Did you know that? On top of that, Here's what they were demanded to do. They were supposed to stand forward and give their name and give where they work. Now, by the time Lee was arrested, everybody knew his name. Okay, it was me. Lee Harvey Oswald was all over the news, his name, and then he worked at the Texas School Book Depository. But he has to stand forth and say, my name is Lee Harvey Oswald, and I work at the Texas School Book Depository. Did you know that? And, of course, the others stood forth. They said, can you imagine? I'm Robert so-and-so, and I work for the Dallas Police Department. Okay, I'm so-and-so, and I work for the, you know, they probably made up something, but I'm just saying that's the only name and the only place that was on all the news. Now, how can you miss it? So when they say they identified Oswald in the lineups, and this is just one part of it, and they also gave plenty of tips uh, as well, you know, to the viewers. Are you sure uh, that you, that, would you look at number two again? They did things like that. So you can't count on any of the IDs that were used in the lineup because Lee Oswald had to give his name and where he worked, which was all over the news. So this is the kind of railroading that happened with Lee. This is a good man who knew if he spoke out to defend himself, others would die. What could he do? He saved the president's life. At least he told me he saved the president's life. He never went into detail. 
He wasn't that kind of person. He was modest about things like that. I loved him. I, I still love him, you know. I know what kind of person he is, and I know that he joined the Marines. And by the way, he tried to join a year early, and they wouldn't take him, you know. So does he hate the United States? Because they'll they'll mention that he was reading communist literature. He planned to to pose as a uh, communist-type person from the beginning after seeing Silver's I Led Three Lives. So, yes, he read communist material. But what they don't say is he also read Hobbes. He read Jefferson. He read all the Founding Fathers stuff. They never mentioned that. Yeah, they conveniently just frame him out and, you know, label him a yep. uh, a communist sympathizer, you know, lone nut kook guy. And I- anybody that's even studied the assassination knows that there is no way that Lee could have shot JFK from the school book <laughs> depository with a piece of crap Mannlicher Carcano rifle. The Hungarian army used to call them the humanitarian rifle, Judith. Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with it. So... It's just it, the physics of just like nine eleven. The physics of the shooting, the ballistics don't match up with anything. It just it, it you know the official story. It doesn't match up. If you uh, Fletcher Prouty uh, talked about if if you uh, used one of those um, the ballistic lasers to you know trace the path or whatever, like the, yeah. the crime scene investigators do. It would be uh, you know if you used a little stick and now it would be a laser or whatever. But if you did it, it would be up something like three feet up and like four feet to the left of actually so supposedly where, you know, the sniper's nest was. So it's just ridiculous to even think about, to think that the government is telling the truth. It's just utterly ridiculous. Well, we could go on and on about uh, how they've messed up the evidence and all that. Anybody who is truly honest, do not trust like John McAdams, any, you know, in, anything they say. Uh, before they could spell my name, they were attacking me. You know, it was amazing. And uh, but th- those are the kind of things that you're going to expect. I expected that. What I didn't expect is that anybody would um, absolutely lie. You know, take my like my emails or things and change them. And then when I say what it was, then they say, you know, what the truth was. They say I changed my story. That's really disgusting. And that's happened to me a number of times. We have a a real problem with people being easily led in in this country. We've got to start caring. We've got to care about the Kennedy assassination because those who who took over the country brought in their own kind. You can trace them from there. That's the clue to what's happened to our country today. Trace who they gave power to, who they allowed to run for president. Poor man. You know, when I look at Obama, you know he was taken to the woodshed. I wonder if he was shown the Zapruder film showing how, you know, Kennedy's head got blown to pieces because he has, as you know, he's uh, brought in everybody who ruined the country, (laughs) ruined us anyway, financially. They're all in power again, all over again. Well, there there can't be change as long as these people are running things behind the scenes. Kennedy really wanted to change this country, and I'm not saying he was a perfect person. No, but this is a man who had, he had no... Uh, ulterior, ulterior motive. He ran for president because he cared about the country. He had no reason. He was rich. He didn't have to do that. And by the way, he's ri- he wrote more than just profiles and courage. He's written. A, he wrote a number of books. I think four or five books. We never hear about them. They're wonderful. So there's a lot about Kennedy that still can be discovered, and it should be. And when you do, you get more and more uh, admiration for this man, what he was as a politician. I don't – look, Ben Franklin is admired by everybody, even though he slept with French women, you know, when he was in France. See, we're – so we have to – and, you know, and his wife was still – you know what I'm saying. So we have the um, – we have, may, may have um, moral problems on one level, but we're not – when we're talking about what that man did for our country – in the same way, you're going to find some flaws or things with Lee Oswald. I do not uh, go to those places necessarily. I go to show you what kind of man this was who did really did love his country. And it's important to understand what kind of man it was that was blamed for killing, you know, said that he's the one that killed Kennedy when he cared about Kennedy and he tried to save his life. That's the irony of it. They had to shoot him. Well, he he knew too much. He had to go, and he's the perfect patsy. 
I mean, he, why not blame everything? They, look what they, they had set him up. And he even, you, you said yourself that he spoke uh, in July of 63 to you about the fact Absolutely. that he felt that he was going to be set up as a patsy to take the fall for uh, Kennedy's murder, correct? He could see it coming. He, uh, he had attempted to rise higher in the CIA, and they put it off. And uh, he, he told me he recognized after going to Spring Hill, where he gave a talk and he gave information. By uh, by the way, um, the Kennedy sent a priest there to that to Spring Hill to that conference, which is described in that interactive timeline that Lee gave a talk for 30 minutes. When Lee gave a talk that lasted over an hour, and then he had 20 minutes of questions and answers. So they they minimize everything he does or did. You see, Lee is uh, concerned because he is not allowed to move forward in the company. And he told me there time may come when I would I would have to denounce him if things got too bad, he wouldn't be able to protect me anymore. And it, it's just dreadful. He didn't want to tell me these things. Read the book, you'll see also many, many instances of things that uh happen. One thing accidentally left out of the book is um it's the American Express. Uh he asked me to to um buy an American Express check for him to pay for his, um, uh, it was an office in Bannister's building there, the Newman building, and it was just for one month's rent. He needed that to have an actual address. Of course, that was 544 Camp Street. So I have that document, but what's not in the book accidentally is out is the letter that he wrote uh, for the saint, you know, about that $30 check, and that he got an office that he wrote to the FPCC, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And I have many small amounts of things like that, uh, there's uh, various p- little pieces of evidence that I saved showing the relationship between him and, and the jobs that he was asked to do, you know, by the CIA and the FBI. He worked for both of them. He was he said he was borrowed by, uh, by the CIA. I suspect he was ONI before that. Lee was so intent on getting into the USSR, and he very proudly told me that four days before his birthday, he actually made it. He wanted to enter the USSR while he was still a teenager, and he managed to do that by four days. He, um, he had, they talk about, well, he didn't have certain scars. One scar was removed. He was in a hospital in Minsk and um, with a so-called ear problem. Part of that ear problem was removing a scar that appeared behind his ear from the mastoidectomy he had when he was five and a half. Just simply by pulling the skin tight and and uh, they uh, sewed it up behind the ear, you couldn't see that scar anymore, so they got rid of it. So, that, so here you have the exhumation, exhumation of Lee Oswald coming uh, sometime later uh, because they said in the autopsy they couldn't see the scar. And, of course, they find the body there, and they see that the there's a mastoidectomy. You can see it on the on the skull, you know. Uh, also, someone said, oh, my gosh, the head has been disconnected from the body, and maybe they replaced the skull with somebody else. No, this happens whenever you lift a skeleton. The, the weight of the, the skull will re, uh, often will snap the connection to the bones, you know, in the neck because it's so heavy. So there are many people who don't understand your... Physics, or they don't understand anatomy and everything. And uh, I just felt very badly that Lee was exhumed uh, instead of being allowed to rest in peace, you know, because of silly reports of people that don't know what really happened. He had scar- scars removed from his body that had been identifying. So I was uh, going to ask you if you thought that was spot. disinfo, the whole, you know, different body in the grave thing, because that. Yeah, uh, no, it's it's him. Okay. Uh, the dental record, this is gross because, you know, people don't understand. Do you know that a friend of mine gave me for my birthday and thought it was something nice? They, they gave me a, a headline saying Kennedy assassinated, you know, blah, 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 and so on. That was the worst day of my life, practically. The last thing I ever want to see is something like that. It's very hard for people to understand my position, you know, that I love this man, I cared about him. I do not want to see how we failed because we tried to save Kennedy's life. 
it's awful, you know. Well, you know what? I don't I don't think he failed if we get his message out, Judith. And I don't I don't think that Lee will have died in vain if we get his message out. And that's one of the reasons that I, you know, pursued the interview with you because it's important to me that people see the truth. You know, look, if if Lee Oswald was a bad guy, uh, then I would, you know, and that was how he really was. I would, I would, I would show him as a bad guy because that's how he was. But the research I've done, Lee was not a bad guy. Even Jim Garrison defended him. That's right. So I mean, there's so it, much about Lee that has been misconstrued, and I remember one person uh, uh, saying, you know, that he he watched a fish die, you know, when he's a kid. And all that, and I thought that was peculiar because Lee, Lee even told me about this incident. Uh, he lost his faith that there was a God because he realized that he had power like over a fish. In his mind, um, God is going to be such a magnificent and you know enormous figure that we're nothing but like ants to him. You know, why would he care? And he, when you remember, we were only a couple decades away from Hitler's extermination camps they were strong on our minds we could see the capacity that man had to kill and harm man without any apparent in- intervention from god yet lee asked me to pray for him uh, <clears throat> in november uh, 20th just two days before the assassination actually less than that 37 and a half hours approximately before the assassination lee asked me to pray for him He's crying out for any help he can get. And I wanted him to just run. He said, if I do that, you know, everybody he cared about would end up dead. They'd kill him. This is the man, there's a man who, informant named Lee, who saved Kennedy's life in Chicago, by, you know, informing uh, the FBI. Kennedy lived three extra weeks. In that time, he was able to give his speech, you know, to American University and other things. They're very important. I believe he, he did that speech before he went to Chicago. I know if not, it was just before that. But at any rate, Kennedy also did some other things. Uh, he also signed the, uh, I think he signed the act to, to bring back troops from Vietnam. There are things that he accomplished, Kennedy accomplished. That, uh, we had him three more weeks because of Lee Oswald. So he's, Lee is a hero, not only once, but twice because he he ended up dying trying to protect Kennedy. And that's important for people did. to know that, again, Oswald was not this, you know, little nasty, you know, man that, you know, was wimpy. And, you know, he decided to kill the president because he was a coward and all that. No, that that's, couldn't be further from the truth. It's very important Absolutely. that people know the truth about Lee Oswald because the man – did not only did he he stop it from happening once uh, he like judith just said he gave us extra time and allowed for extra things to be done lord knows how that changed history i mean you yeah. everything has an effect so this man and they know he was a hero they they know he was a good person and they set him up because the powers that be do not care they're evil and they do not care look what they did they forced ruby to to shoot him I mean, Ruby. Oh, yeah. Ruby said plenty oh, of Jack times. Jack Ruby did not want to kill. This is someone he knew for years. I, Jack Ruby. I, I met Jack Ruby. Uh, I thought he was Sparky Rubenstein at the time. Nobody uh, dissuaded me as to his, you know, or told me his real name at the time. But uh, my gosh, uh, he liked Lee. In fact, of course, it's on record that somebody who has been identified as Jack Ruby called twice, saying they're going to shoot him if you know they're going to kill him if they transfer him. But, of course, they did it anyway. They wanted him to die. Nobody could be more open. That You have that perp walk going on, you know, and on both sides. No guns are drawn. There's no protection. Nobody in front protecting him from any frontal assault. Lee t- turns his head. You can see it in the, some of the films. And you can see he's looking right at Jack Ruby. But, Jack, you know what they told me? Dave Ferry told me after this was over. He said, Please think, think of it this way. He said, Jack Ruby, he'd forgotten that I didn't know that Jack Ruby and Sparky Rubenstein were the same person. He said, and so this, he, he, they were trying to make me feel better. They said it was like a mercy killing that once he got transferred to the other, you know, to the to the county uh, instead of to the, from the, you know, city jail to the county, 
So he'd been, he would have been tortured probably to death because he would never have admitted that Kennedy, you know, that he shot Kennedy. They would have tortured him horribly. And so they were trying to console me and, you know, with that. Yeah, there's no way Lee would have been allowed to uh, get to trial. I I oh, recall, no. Judith, you, um, I had, uh, I had I had listened to like I said I listened to many interviews with you for that or the, the interviews that you've done I've listened to them many times I should say, and um, one thing I remember you saying is um, that Ruby had mentioned to you that he knew uh, Lee from the time he was a child. Yeah, from the time he was like around twelve or thirteen years old, maybe even earlier, because um, Jack Ruby came uh, often to New Orleans and also he was lived himself you know in Dallas and. Lee lived in both places as a young person. But um, that family was very closely tied to the crime family. We could, through Lillian uh, Muret, who had married uh, Dutz Muret, uh, Lee's uncle, by, you know, by that marriage, who uh, worked directly with Marcello. And, in fact, he, he was a bookmaker for him and everything else. They had a long, close relationship. One of the most touching things, it's in the book, but after um, Lee has been arrested, and that was a setup, okay, he had to be dirtied up. And Lee told me how bad he felt. Uh, he finally was arrested in New Orleans after passing out FPCC literature. And uh, he said, you know, all the time I was growing up here, he lived in really tough places like on Exchange Alley or Exchange Place. He went to a real tough school, Beauregard, where they would beat you up, you know, and they were really hard and rough. He never got arrested, never got in trouble. He said, now look, in my own hometown, I've been arrested. He, he was almost in tears over it. So here's what happened. His uncle came to his came to the house there at 4905 uh, Magazine Street, walked in, and he bawled Lee out in front of um, Marina, Lee's wife, for what, uh, you know, for humiliating the family and for what he was doing. And Lee just took it. And then they walked outside. Lee opened the car door for his uncle to get in, and Lee said, you know, you don't know who I really am, basically. Lee told me this. His uncle got back out of the car, and he looked at him, and and he said, uh, I do, son. You know, and, uh, I know who you are. I know because Marcello told me. That's how close. See, Marcello was just... In oh so type of the CIA to try to get Castro, Marcelo knew that Lee was there to try to help kill Fidel Castro. That was his one of Lee's jobs. This brave man was set to go into Cuba. They changed things, but originally he was going to go into Cuba, and that's why all that got started. It is fantastic to me anyway that Lee was so relieved. Um, he realized that his uncle understood who he really was. And he, his uncle said, I don't know about your wife. I don't know if she knows anything. So, you know, I went over there to, uh, you know, I'm upset. He was upset because of, uh, he didn't know uh, if Lee was, how far Lee was going to go with this, you know, how much more humiliation the family had to take and so on. But anyway, he was, said he was proud of him because he realized what he was really up to and uh, understood Marcello had told him, and the relief that Lee felt was just incredible. So Lee took humiliation and everything in order to hold on to this picture of him as uh, someone who liked Cuba and wanted to go to Cuba. Yet you have Lee um, after Mexico City when he returns. You know, he was uh, didn't he didn't stay all 15 days to try and get that transit visa into Cuba and then over to uh, Russia the way it was set up. He didn't stay all that length of time because the product that we had wouldn't live that long. When, when he, he didn't have the pickup, he was left there drying in the wind. He left that. He left the materials there, and that's why he comes back with one less suitcase. Everybody notices it's in the official record. He comes back with one less suitcase uh, because he left the materials behind. Okay, in Mexico City, and when he comes out, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when he comes out again. And he goes to Dallas, and then on his birthday, by the time he, on his birthday, which is only like, we're talking about less than, uh, it says three weeks later, he gets his visa to go to Cuba. Now, he did all that 
racing around and causing problems and I've got to get to Cuba, got to get to Cuba, remember? He did all that. And yet when he gets his transit visa to Cuba, which is only three weeks later instead of months, four months like they said it would be, he doesn't go. In fact, he never mentions Cuba again. Okay, that was because our project was over. As you know, it, 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 the materials didn't get picked up. And Lee realized that he had been set up, that he'd really just been sent to Mexico City so that he would look like he had, uh, and they have him, uh, Kostikov and things like that, people that he didn't talk to, assassin. Uh, they've obviously set him up so that he could become the scapegoat that he was like connected with the USSR. Later, they they have to scrap that idea because uh, you can cause World War III by that going on. So anyway, uh, right from there, we knew that Lee was in horrible trouble. I was going to ask you about Mexico City. The pictures the, that the, the quote-unquote photos of Lee outside of huh. the embassy looks nothing like him. I mean, you you could tell. Well, that he of course had, they had they they had his photos, my friend. They're not going to show a photo with him because he was smart. He didn't ever go into the embassy by himself. He had a companion with him. He told me so. He was a guy. He was a blood. He was somewhat shorter than Lee. I'm not sure who he was, but Lee told me he would never go into the embassy by himself. And, you know, he's always going to have someone with him, uh, and uh, that's what he did. So they can't show that. They can't show another. They can't show a CIA asset or somebody with him. Can they, how, they can't cut him out of the photo, you know. So they don't show that at all. They show a completely different photo and pretend they made a mistake. Or then they later they say the cameras weren't working that day. Come on. You know, that's impossible. It's just yeah, that happens true. a lot. Every time there's an event, like, you know, the cameras outside the Pentagon on 9-11. Yeah, all, right. All the, all the cameras in France dur- uh, during the cr- car crash of Princess Diana. It's uh-huh. just, it's ridiculous. Every time something major happens, the cameras don't work. You know, they'll, they'll work for a 7-Eleven heist, but they don't work for something like that, right? Exactly. Why are we paying all these millions of dollars for these cameras? It's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's absurd. Money, it, money, money is power, and p- power can create a lot of evil, unfortunately. I, I'll tell you one thing. I, I, my, my whole goal in life, are, there are three things. One, to get the truth out and to get Lee's name exonerated. Once you do that, that whole house of cards falls, and you realize... We have a corrupt government in place that doesn't care about the people. You know, we have to start from the bottom up and replace them from the bottom up because you can't do it from the top down. You can't do it. It's impossible. That's number one. The second is to create wherever you walk. You can't change the world, but you know you are responsible for where you walk. If I see a little stray dog and it's right in my path, I'm responsible for that little stray dog. God's put that in my path. And I'm just saying, where I can't change the world, but where I, I walk, I try to make the world a better place. And the last, I'm an artist and, and I'm a poet. And I try to create beauty because without beauty, life is not worth living. Very true. I mean, I I, I do my website, my radio show, and my you know I I write articles, I I do video editing and stuff, all to to stop the new world order. But I, there are times where I have to take an hour or two off and go enjoy the beauty there of life go. because if I don't, I, you forget what you're fighting for. So you do have exactly. to enjoy exactly. Yeah, and one of the uh, measures of a human being, I think, is is um, do they love children? Do you love you know? Do you love children? And I'll tell you, nobody loved children as much as Lee Harvey Oswald. By the way, he never used his middle name Harvey. You know that letter where um, they say it came from Mexico, and they wonder if if he wrote it. And it says Lee Harvey Oswald signed, and it's to Mister Hunt. But Lee didn't like his middle name, Harvey, okay? And he would have put H. He'd always written H. He didn't write out his middle name. Only the government does that. He only, only when he was forced to would he write it out, you know, for some document. Yeah, the government has put, a tendency to, to, to make simple mistakes like that constantly. Yeah, they, they certainly do. So he didn't write that letter. And then there you've got um, some... Oh, anyway, it's what's interesting is that it is easy for me to see when they're lying because I knew him and I was with him, and I was with him almost every day. And he protected me a great deal, though I look like Marina, and that helps a lot. But here's the thing that I think is important. Imagine you've got a, a man every single day uh, going through various things. I'm I'm with him, or, I, or we've talked about it, even days I didn't wasn't with him. We 
we talked about everything. We had so much in common. And then I read these things he was supposed to have done, you know, or said. It's just not, it's easy, easy for me to see who's lying. For example, this Riley employee that they, over at Riley, we both were hired at Riley the same day. It, it was, um, we did everything together. Uh, we were actually hired at Standard Coffee Company for one week before we moved over to Riley together. But I, I'm looking at this FBI report. They interviewed this Riley employee. He said, oh, yes, this guy, he's weird, you know. He would sit there during the breaks smoking a cigarette and gazing out, you know, and then staring into space, you know, like he's crazy, you know. Lee didn't smoke. So right away you know this guy's lying. So it's easy for me to see the liars and who they are. And it's easy for me to see who the people are who are, you know, lying about Lee. So I, I've got the list. And at the very top is John McAdams, you know. And then you've got, like, um, Tracy Parnell, and you've got a, a bunch of others. But they're all there. And uh, and none of these people knew Lee personally, and here's you I never who knew met Lee personally. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they can't even begin to understand. And, but, and talk about them as a little shrimp or something like that. Well, they've got these big Texas... Uh, guys in there on both sides and make him look little and all that. Lee Oswald went through boot camp at the Marines. This is one tough little guy, and he's not that little. By the way, 5'9 was the average height for a man back in 1963. I've got the statistics on it. They're trying to make him out to be a little shrimp, you know. Well, it's he easier to label him a crazy. bad guy that way. You know, it's that yeah. that he's this puny little weak-minded little weak lone gunman troll type person. And when that's not how Lee was at all, but they have to do that in order to get people to buy into the whole vilification story. Well, the number one thing that proves uh, it should prove to anyone who has an open mind that Lee did not shoot from that window is that 30 seconds or so after the final shot, the boxes are moved. You can see them in photos they've taken of the window. The boxes are being moved. Who did that? It couldn't have been Lee Oswald. He's down there 90 seconds later down on the second floor. Can't be him. Who's up there moving boxes? Come on, they set this up. And, and of course, for a long time, Bonnie Lee Williams is, uh, Bonnie Ray Williams' is, uh, chicken sandwich and so on is, um, considered that was what Lee Oswald coldly was eating a chicken sandwich and drinking a bottle of pop, okay, before the motorcade comes through. Turns out it was Williams up there. But no, we have a Kennedy series that just came out showing Lee Oswald eating a chicken sandwich up there, see, waiting for the, oh, it's awful. Even though we know, even in, in the Warren Commission itself, in the 26 volumes, you find out that Bonnie Ray Williams was up there eating that sandwich. There were people who wanted Lee's stomach, you know, uh, pumped to see if the sandwich was in his stomach. It's ridiculous. What did you think of the the movie JFK by Oliver Stone? Did you think it was in a, a somewhat accurate portrayal? Well, when I saw it, first of all, my son brought it home, and I I, I had to walk out on it. my my whole family remembers that because I had a whole bunch of teenagers there, and I on uh, Saturday night when we had films. When my son brought that home, he was home from college, 1991, brought that home for everybody to watch. It made me so sick to my stomach when I started hearing Kennedy's voice, and I realized it was film JFK. I had to walk out and leave those teens by themselves. That that was something I'd never done before, so they never forgot it. it years later, when my, my last child left home, the day she left on her honeymoon, that, that night I rented the film JFK, and I watched it. I was finally alone. And it, well, um, in many ways, Gary Oldman tried, but all he had to work with were these um, tape recordings, you know, of Lee's voice, which are, by the way, they make his voice sound a little teeny bit higher than it was. You know how tape recordings did back then. So you're, you're listening to his voice is a little bit high, teeny bit higher than it really was. So that's the first thing. And then the other is that, he has him stuttering or, you know, hesitating a lot. But he was hesitating because uh, every time he was being recorded, he was on television. I mean, radio, you know what I mean, TV or radio. And and this was being recorded also for a a, a uh, platter, a, you know, a recording that they were making to sell as, uh, by Inca. 
And that's not that wasn't quite his real voice any more than when I'm talking to you now. It's not quite the way I would talk if I were talking to you face to face. There are hesitations and things that just were not part of his normal way of talking. So when Gary Oldman is talking, he uses hesitations in ordinary conversations or whatever. That's not quite the way he talked, you know. But all in all, they did a pretty good job. What really got to me is that Oliver Stone saw there were problems. He saw where things didn't match up. Why would an ordinary Marine be tested for the Russian language, for heaven's sakes? That's a giveaway. We were their enemies. Nobody's going to learn Russian unless they needed it. They don't, Marines are not going to go and test somebody. And again, Tracy Parnell in this interactive timeline says, Oswald requests to be tested in the Russian language. You know, he didn't request it. He was obviously, they're not going to give him a test. They made him take the test. So you have all these uh, inconsistencies. A lot of this comes out in the movie. They did, Oliver Stone, I give him kudos. He did a great job in showing where the problems were. Uh, there are a few mix-ups here and there, but all in all, um, it's a great job. He was a great man to do it. In uh, the last conversation you had with Lee was, yeah. it was, if I remember correctly, was it, was it, it was the day before or two days before the assassination? It was, well, he called me and it was November 20th when he called real late at night. It actually turned to November 21st as we were speaking. Kennedy was killed on the 22nd, so you can see how, what we're talking about. Lee knows that he, he, if he leaves, he can save his life. If he stays, he says it will be one less bullet aimed at Kennedy because he would have been replaced by somebody who would have shot at Kennedy. Would have shot at him. He pretended that he would have shot at him. Uh, for a long time, he thought that he had penetrated the group uh, there. Uh, we uh, Near the end, he believed that he had been lured into it, you know, on purpose. There were too many things. Like he said, every time he met somebody, it was somebody he hadn't met before. Um, and, you know, they give fake names and things like that. And you don't do this unless you're slated to die. They're not going to go and show you a whole bunch of people unless they know you're not going to survive. You see what I mean? They're not going to show uh, these various people unless they know that you're never going to be able to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. They know they knew he yep. wasn't going to be able to say anything, so it didn't matter to them. It was didn't almost like they were throwing a lot of in his face. Yeah, so they're showing him a lot of people. That doesn't mean they trusted him to leave. That showed that they, they were going to get rid of him. He would not survive. He, he he was a dead man walking. He knew it. He stuck it out. He I loved him. We, we cried our heads off. We cried. I mean, this is a man who would cry. You know, he wasn't that mean and tough and everything like that. He cried. He didn't, he didn't want to die. But he didn't run either. And uh, and he didn't betray any of the, you know, by saying who he really was. He didn't betray him. And that's why I have respect for Lee, because the the story, the, the monster version that, that people think they know is not the real Lee Oswald. And once you understand the real Lee Oswald and you get to know the real Lee Oswald, you realize that he was probably the kind of guy you'd like to go sit down and have a beer with or have a cup of coffee with. And, and Yeah, yeah, he gave up smoking and drinking because he became CIA. He gave up smoking and drinking when he became a spy. He didn't drink anymore. In fact, Marina Oswald is on record saying that she, you know, he didn't like the fact that he, he's in the Warren Commission uh, in her in the very first um, interview. It's Marina Oswald. It's her first interview, and she says that uh, she was upset because he wouldn't drink or smoke <laughs> like she did, you know. You got this, so you got this man who doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. By the way, he doesn't swear. Now, but he will pretend he's drinking when he's having, has to do something, you know. By the way, the, he had had a number of lovers. He was quite a lover. This thing about that he was not a good lover, that's baloney. Absolute baloney. When he was in Japan, um, he had a girlfriend. He, he had... When it's on record, you know, he was dating women from the Queen Bee. The Queen Bee was a very expensive... Uh, escort service going on there at the, at the Queen Bee, all right? And uh, he one date with one of them would have used up his whole entire $80 Marine pay. I mean, it's impossible. I mean, they would, you know, it cost $50, $60 for one night, and he's seen with them all the time. He even brought one of the girls to the base. Um, 
he gets a venereal di- disease, and uh, the doctor puts there in the line of duty. Now they're trying to say they did that for everybody. That's not true. He got a venereal disease because he was getting information. There is a we we uh, my friend Lola and I have put together some movies about Lee at YouTube. If you go to Lola with a number four, and then L H O, no G V B, and then another four. And it's LHO, so it'd be Lola for JAVB for LHO. If you go to YouTube there, you'll see a um, number, uh, five or six videos we put together showing Lee's career and who he really was. And that's free. You don't have to buy my book. The book is important because it's going to give you the truth. And the book, imagine, I cannot sign any of them. We could not get reviews. The Publishers Weekly would not review them. The, the book at all. Jesse Ventura did say it was his, that book and JFK and the um, Unspeakable were his favorite conspiracy books. He called the book phenomenal. And if you read it, I'm hoping that you'll get a picture of Lee Oswald that will forever be in your mind. You'll know who he really was. You'll understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, if I had said Lee Oswald had killed Kennedy, I'd be a rich woman. Instead, I've lost my jobs. I've been in the hospital five times in five years from so-called accidents. I've had to move overseas because of death threats. I can't even live in one country more than three months at a time. So, of course, I'm giving you this interview, and I won't be able to do another one for a long time because it's not that easy. Yeah, and I can attest to the fact that Judith is not uh, blowing smoke. You know, she is, everything she's telling you about what she's gone through is 100% accurate. And it is very cloak and daggerish to get in touch with her because of what has happened to her. And, you know, it's her safety is of the utmost importance because she, it, you know, yes, she's, she comes out, she taught, you know, and she, she does, that puts her in the spotlight. And that, that's courageous, but she should not be expected to, you know, be, you know, well, she should be, you know, nobody should expect that she should be um, very it, it, you know, it shouldn't be easy to get in touch with her because of what Was she it knows. easy to get in touch with me, sir? Was it no, easy? No, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, no. And I, I have to honestly say I, I, sh- I didn't expect that it would be because of what you know and what you've talked about. In fact, I didn't – honestly, Judith, I didn't think I'd be able to get in touch with you because of the information that you've come out with. You know, I wasn't even sure if um, – you know, when I first started, uh, this, when I when I first started looking into how I could interview you, I wasn't even sure if you if you you know were still willing to do interviews and stuff. And then I realized that, uh, I, you know, I I talked to uh, Jim Fetzer and he was like, oh no no, I'll, I'll I'll see what I can do. And he helped me get in contact with you. And I have to say, you are the one of the bravest people I've ever met, and you are really an an awesome individual. I mean, just the the courage you have and the tenacity that you have that you, you you know you're you love Lee so much that you're willing to go through this to clear his name nobody does that for anybody anymore you know you're you're an example of humanity Judith and I I I, I have to say that it it gives me hope in my heart for humanity when I see people that have the courage that you do and so I have to personally applaud you for what you do and I thank you for writing your book and coming out. Well, I thank you for being there. That you're as young as you are, that gives me hope. Imagine if, because when we're 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 gonna die, you know, we're not gonna. I'm 68. Oh, I never thought I'd be overseas and not be able to see my children, my grandchildren. My my youngest daughter had her first baby. I could not be there. If my mother died when I was in the political asylum program, boy, when I went to political asylum, that was something else. But, and I, I was not accepted. You can't, nobody from the United States who's a non combatant can be accepted into political asylum. But they did protect me for over 10 and a half months. God bless them. They put a bunch of junk out there, you know, anything that would, I, they told me just basically send any amount of junk they wanted. But privately, they uh, went into what was going on and they did help me so I, that my family and my friends could get together with donations and everything else. That's what keeps me going. They, I have a chance at least to speak out, and, and um, even though I have to move uh, from country to country, uh, thank God, uh, people understand that 
I, I would come to back to the United States if I could. I love my country. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I can't see them. To make sure, tell the listeners exactly what you've been through, like the personal sacrifices, so they understand. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. And, and, and what happened to me is not important. The fact that I can speak, still speak and I'm alive is what's important. The fact that you care that there's a chance that you people will not only read the book, but you're going to, by the way, I don't get very much money from the books. It's, it's, it's you know, it's not just possible, it's, especially with the U.S. dollar where, where it is, you know, right now. You'd be in, better in off selling it in euros. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, I mean, uh, it's, I have 25% less uh, value to the dollar now than it was when I first came over here. Can you imagine? what's happening to our country. I care about our country. And I tell you right now, the very key is the Kennedy assassination and following it. If only people understand, don't, they've got to eat better. They've got to try and do whatever they can to protect their environment because the, the, the food, the water, and the air in America is just about enough to kill you. I tell you, it just really gets to me, uh, the fact that so many people do not have adequate medical care Everything's going backward. That was not the American dream. We're not supposed to be working 60 hours a week. It's supposed to have gone the other direction. We're supposed to get more civilized, not not turned back into serfs, servants. You know, it's it's breaking my heart to see what's happened to our country. So part of this is because I love the country, but the big part is I love him. And I'm sick of uh, the lies I've been told about him. To my dying breath, I tell you, I... I I swear, this is a man who loved his country, a good man. He gave his life for his country. Lee, from my research, was definitely more than this monster that they've made him out to be. And again, that's one of the things that pushed me was, you know, I, I find out, you know, I respect people like Jim Garrison, okay? Yeah. And when I see Jim Garrison in multiple interviews and papers he wrote and in, you know just speaking engagements anywhere and he always said when when questioned about Oswald he always said Lee was a, a good individual he was the kind of you know he was a good man just wanted to he be a good vilified. marine exactly that's what, yeah that's what he said he wanted to be just wanted to be a good marine yep and, and I'm, he, I'm a veteran he myself so close to the truth I'm a veteran myself so and yes, and that's, that impresses me. You have experienced yourself the consequences of evil, I'm sorry, an evil uh, situation where when you have wars that are supposedly to protect us and actually have caused more enemies, and I live overseas and I know whereof I speak, have caused more enemies to our country than any anything else could possibly do it is to go and keep bombing other countries, interfering with their you know, their destinies and so on, instead of protecting our own borders and staying out of that, you know? Well, it's see, to, to, for me to find out that this guy was a good Marine and, you know, he was, you know, he, to me, he was, if you've ever heard of the organization called, called the Oath Keepers, uh, hmm. he, to me, he was an, Lee would be considered an Oath Keeper. If oh, he'd be. If people understood, and I'm an Oath Keeper myself. So for it, for me to say that that I'm not just saying that because I'm not, I'm like well you know blah 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 no Lee would be considered an oath keeper this man gave his life to defend his oath to the Constitution and protect the country and the citizens of this country against and the president against what he saw what was coming down the pike. <laughs> when I first spoke out in 1999, I said that Lee tried to uh, you know he did his, everything he could to save the president. You have no idea what disbelief. Little by little, it's changing. You know, this year I received photographs from people, and I hope it will continue, where I, they would send me pictures where they had put, placed roses on Lee's grave. It's, the message is getting through. That's good. And I, I'm sure every time you, you realize that, that, that probably is uplifting for your heart because you know oh and realize God. that people see through the lies and that Lee is not as vilified as he once was. David Atley Phillips, who was Lee's handler, is on record as saying that he had the opportunity and pleasure of urinating on Kennedy's grave. Wow. So that's what Lee was working with. Wow. Just, I'm speechless. 
What a scumbag. That's the kind of people. Yeah, well, that that was his handler. And we have Gates and Fonzie uh, inter, uh, interviewed uh, Antonio Vesiana, who says that Lee was there with him meeting David Atlee Phillips. Okay. It's on record. It's, it, you know, it... It's amazing how they they set him up, they sheep dipped him, and then they they hung him out to dry. And I'm glad that Lee knew what was going on. At least I'm glad. Yes, I'm, he did. He, I'm he, glad he, he wasn't knew. just. You know what I mean? I'm glad he wasn't hung out to dry as fast as he was. Unscribed, S C R I B D. I have uh, material such as the granny knot, um, how Lee, the blanket that they found uh, in the garage was supposed to have held the the uh, rifle. It turns out it was tied with granny knots, which no Marine would ever do. But unscribed, again, I'm going to say the word S-E-R-I-B-D, plus my name, Judith Very Baker. It's J-U-D-Y-T-H, Very, V-A-R-Y, Baker. You put those together and you'll come up with various um, writings I've done showing how Lee was innocent, and including like the granny knot, which is one of the newest ones. They're really worth reading to give you an idea of what kind of man he was and how he's been vilified and and how they did it. It's it's just incredible. And it's not people go, Oh, well, we would have to have a vast conspiracy. It is. You should see the amount of people that are involved in it. I mean, Lyndon Johnson, you got people like mm-hmm. Clint Murkison, the you know, the oil guys, yep. um, the CIA, the mafia. It wasn't one it's like 9/11. It wasn't one organization. You to pull something off like that, you it requires help from people in multiple organizations. Yeah, and they're trying to say, well, you know, somebody would have talked. Well, they did, and they died. Yeah, everybody that uh, ever ever said anything died. Look at the amount of witnesses and, and people in that were close to the assassination or anybody involved in the assassination that died. Two of the 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 one the one dancer that worked for Jack Ruby opened her yeah. mouth and they found her hanging by her Toreador pants yeah and then you've got uh, well look at poor Mary Sherman you've got Ed Haslam's wonderful book about um, Mary um, about Mary Sherman you know yeah Doctor Mary's and, Monkey I think it's called right yeah it's called Doctor Mary's Monkey and there you find out that this poor woman and she you find her uh, just like Guy Bannister. Oh, Bannister, here's Guy Bannister, who knew a lot. And, of course, his friend in the book, you'll find out that Hugh Ward was involved a lot a lot with Lee, all right, and with his Dallas his trip to Mexico City. Hugh Ward dies a month before, uh, just a few weeks before Guy Bannister, okay? Guy Bannister dies just a month before Mary Sherman. Mary Sherman dies the day the Warren Commission comes to get testimonies in New Orleans that are unsolicited. She's on the front page. And I'm telling you, who's going to talk when they see that one of the star witnesses it would have been if she'd spoken out? You know, you find out she's been murdered, she's slashed, she's uh, burned. Uh, they don't mention that her that her arm is missing. Okay? Her right arm is missing. Totally. Um, people who say, well, oh, linear particle accelerators cannot vaporize an arm there uh, there are a couple families on record where we know, and Ed Haslam has a record of one one person who was totally vaporized by one of these machines. Uh, he keeps their name private, but I've seen the records. Uh, only a few things have come out. A lot of people have tried to say, oh, that could not have happened, that linear ex- particle accelerator burned off her arm. I've worked uh, with people who worked with those machines, and of course it could do that. We, so we have poor Mary Sherman is found dead the same day that she could have given testimony to the Warren Commission. That's no accident. No. Well, look at Lee Bowers. He was a witness. Uh, he uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> He was in the, the yard, the railroad yard, you know, uh, uh, above the, the grassy knoll area, and he saw people and stuff, and he testified, and then he dies in a single car accident. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and you never hear about the single car accident. You find out later that people saw that he was actually pushed off the road. That never comes out. So, <laughs> oh, there's so much out there. When you get all the, more of the facts, I uh, sometimes it breaks my heart to see how people, of course, they don't have time. They believe the first thing they see. 
trust me, the first things when you plug in Lee Harvey Oswald to come up, I, I checked it out. It takes 20, it, at least this is a month ago, it took 21 pages to get to anything that was telling the truth about Lee. 21 pages you have to go down before you finally run into something that resembles the truth. It's all the official version and very, you know, mirrors of it. By the way, on Wikipedia, um, when we tried to fix the, Wiki, uh, the biography on Lee Oswald because it says that he dropped out of school and it mentions the Marines, it never mentioned that he got his GED in the Marines. So we tried to add that tiny little fact that he did get his, finish his education, he got his GED in the Marines. And when they not only erased that, but then they erased my Wikipedia biography. Wow. So, yeah, well, look so, what they did. Uh, look what look what Lady Bird Johnson did with your your uh, yeah. your three episodes. The episode, the you know the three yep. the three infamous episodes of the men who killed Kennedy, which is actually the the love affair was the episode that woke me up to you. I found it uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, probably about five or six years ago. I've now. lost 50 pounds since then. I was sick. I just got out of the hospital. I've been treated with steroids. And I was, you know, I, I look like a... That was from one of the sausage. attempts on your life, correct? The hospital visit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's because I've been hit by a, a car and um, I had terrible pain and all that. I had neck injury and everything and I was in the hospital and they had, uh, then I fell and I got a second concussion. I hardly knew my name anyway and I could hardly walk and I... I did it did it anyway and pretended I was okay, you know, but it was not easy. Anyway, I'm, I'm 50 pounds lighter now. I look a whole lot better, but that's not the point. The point is is that people will judge your looks and, and, and not who you are, you know, what you're trying to say. But not only Lady Bird, but it was also Eisner from Disney was against it. And we had former President Ford and former President Jimmy Carter, and we had uh, Valenti, Jack Valenti of the Motion Picture Guild, all of them came up against it. Now, what are you going to do about that? Down, you know, out it went. By the way, Nigel Turner has never been seen again. Talk about people in hiding. Try to reach Nigel Turner. Yeah, what happened to him? Well, he, you know, if I, he had a family, so you don't see him anymore. Never hear of him anymore. It's over. I guess that was the end of his career, huh? Yeah. Well, I don't know. In 2013, he's a brave man. He might come out again with something. I don't know. I hope he survives it. It's that bad. I mean, that's just, well, you know, he, look at his, the the last three episodes. See, the, the six that are out, the reason why, I, I know the reason why they let those that stay out. That's yeah, because, because they're not the truth. They're not getting close enough to the truth. Exactly. They They touch on it a little bit. They brush up against it, but barely and they create more confusion than anything else because it, you know the first six episodes are the mafia did it no the cuban dissidents did it no this no the french no did it yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah the pointing fingers are over it's the last three well the episode about oswald is i like that episode where because they they did show a lot of the interviews with jim garrison where jim Gar- you know and jim garrison yeah. was saying that he you know he was he was explaining that you know if they humanize oswald the reason they have to demonize him is because if they show that he has a human side you know people might start to look at it a little different and say hmm wait a minute you know he wasn't such a monster so they have to vilify him. And that's why, well, again, it's important to, to me, it's important that you get as much time as you need to, you know, tell your story because it's it's very, very important to get it out. Well, there. there's one thing people wonder. Uh, they say, how can you remember all those conversations, you know, word for word? Because I do. But they, what they've forgotten is that if somebody's talking about the murder of the president of the United States, you're going to remember. You will remember. And, you know, I I kept them in my heart. Um, uh, the another thing is that for some reason, I I can remember, uh, by the way, 60 Minutes did a story on it. I'm not exactly as eidetic of memory as some of them now that I've had the head injuries, but I still can see whole days in front of me what we ate and everything 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago without a problem, you know. My family knows this. It's um, just the way it is. Now, I get lost going around the corner, but if you ask me what somebody said or what happened, you know, on a day, even the hour, I can usually get it right. I can tell you the weather. It's just the way it is. It's just the way my mind is. I've got too much stuff in my head, frankly. Well, you are a wealth of uh, information. I mean, 
you are a very smart lady. I was talking to you, you know, off air, and yeah. uh, you knew all about chemtrails and 9-11. I was just blown away, Judith. I was like, holy cow. Well, it's... Um it's uh, kind of a curse in a way. And, uh, I mean, I read, uh, you know, I read the whole encyclopedia before I got out of high school, Encyclopedia Britannica. You can have a whole bunch of knowledge, but that doesn't mean you know how to use it properly or that you, that you can appropriate it for uh, to help your own life or anything like that. I'm not very practical, and you know, I always <laughs> – it was easy to manipulate me. I was easily manipulated because I didn't have as much – the people experience. I had boyfriends, I had fun, you know, played, you know, dance, rock and roll and all that, but I could be easily fooled because I was young and impressionable. I was no, impressed. Not now, things. though, I'll bet. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll bet you're no an way, avid, Jose. avid pro right now. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, with all the hindsight they have and everything, watching what's happening to our country now, my heart is filled with grief because I, I frankly don't see any... Uh, it's not funny when you see all these mass grave coffins and things put together. Um, imagine you can have something released among the population, what they say, get rid of the eaters. You don't need all these people to stay healthy and wealthy and strong at the top. You only need about a tenth of the people that are on the face of the earth right now to run things. Well, look at the can look at the cancer rate. You know, they they found out that the, they had put a vi a cancer causing virus in the oh, in yeah. the, the polio vaccine about what was it, like forty years ago, and now all of a sudden they knew this too. They uh, deliberately released it anyway, and there are so many contaminations uh, that don't even get caught uh, until later. The contamination is such a is. Uh, an easy thing that can happen, but what's worse, I think, is that they don't seem to care. They really don't seem to care about. I was reading about uh, a vet who was saying, "You know what we do with the puppies? We check their antibody levels before we give them their their vet their shots, because if their antibody levels are high, we don't give them the shots because it doesn't work very well. You know, they never check to see if a, a child is still nursing its mother before insisting that they get shots. How can we do better for our puppies than we do for human beings? Right." Because the veterinarians actually care about the puppies, whereas the yeah, the, yeah, human the, doctors don't. Give, yeah, if they give the vaccine at this, uh, when the antibody rate is high, it's not going to work well. They have to wait the antibody goes low enough so it can get an antibody response. Okay, they don't do any tests like that on human beings, on babies. That's ridiculous. What do you think about the whole swine flu thing? Well, I'll put it this way: if you want to go and scare people to death, you and you, you put something out there to see just how much. Uh, you have to do uh, in order to get control of a population by fear. Fear makes people do almost anything. And also, people do not like to be moved from their spot that they're familiar with. You, so it's like the frog, you know. You put a frog in warm water and you raise the degree one, the temperature one degree at a time, and the frog will end up boiling to death and not even know it. So you just test and see just how much the population will take. And you, you know they go that far, and then you add more fear factor. They'll, they'll accept more. They'll accept more and more and more. Finally, what happens? We have our freedoms removed from us. I, the violence in America is disgusting. I, I'm overseas here, and I realize how much. Do you know that in Sweden, for example, it's against the law to have uh, your picture taken at the ATM? It's considered an invasion of privacy. Wow. You've lost this in America. Over in Turkey, I mean, this is Turkey I'm talking about, okay? It's nobody's, you know how this stuff you have to fill out. In, you know, I'm, um, there's just, uh, there, um, I'll just put it this way. You give out so much private information in America. It's amazing. You allow it to happen. You allow tremendous invasions of your privacy. But police treat you rotten. Absolutely rotten. It's not their fault. They're, I was looking at Star Wars. When Star Wars came out with all that battle equipment and all that, now we have, we have armed police for riot. They look like the chaos of Star Wars. Yeah, they look like the stormtroopers. They do. And I'm telling you, and they're taught not, not tasering and things like that. How dare anyone use tasering on people? Do you know that I, I saw... Um, Police rounding up somebody uh, over in Sweden, 
I'm using Sweden as a good example because there are only nine million people there, and they have one. They have happy people, and they were after an immigrant who was trying to escape who they wanted to deport, and they they chased him down and they put him in the car. They didn't handcuff him or anything. They're not allowed to show their photographs of their faces, you know, either, on TV. It's considered an invasion of privacy. In America, how dare we? You remember Jack Ruby is walking along and he's wearing a suit to his trial, right? Out of jail. And yet I see people in orange jumpsuits being taken into courtrooms, okay, for arraignment. This is wrong. You're supposed, how can you be tried by a jury of your peers when you're wearing an orange jumpsuit? It's dehumanization. And in, in fact, some smart inmates, probably their lawyers, but have fought and said, you know, uh, this is how am I supposed to have a, a fair trial if, yeah. if I, you know, I come in and we're dehumanized already. You know, I'm in this orange jumpsuit yeah. and they, oh, they took oh. one Nazi, one skinhead guy, and they actually, the court is paying to have him uh, makeup applied to cover his tattoos on his neck and his face so that he doesn't, he looks uh, more human and less menacing. Yeah. Well, see, the point is, is a, a person who's defending themselves that should have the right to uh, all uh, p possible, that's decent, you know, remedies. I, I just, I, I see my country. Uh, this is one reason. It, when you know what happened to Lee, and you see how it was handled, and you see what has been done since, and how they still cover it up. How dare they say that for 75 years we couldn't get these files. And by the way, we have such technology now. I'll tell you right now, nothing that comes out from the government, I'd say from now on, should be trusted because they can use old paper, they know how to use old inks and fix them just right so you can't tell even under a microscope they won't crack in any way but except the way old ones did and so on and so forth. Um, it started Elder Hiss, you know, the typewriter? You know about the typewriter? Yep. Yeah, okay, that typewriter turned out, you know, to be, that was fake, all that was faked against Elder Hiss. Good old Nixon really knew what he was doing. We have, right from the beginning, uh, you can see these methods used. You can't trust anything that comes out of the so-called evidence about the Kennedy assassination anymore. Don't believe, anything that's come out, anytime I'd say from now on, don't believe a word of it because they can too easily fake the information. Forget about, well, we'll know someday. No, we won't. We can't trust it. Lee said that there were dozens of secretaries retyping information about what was going to happen. Can you believe that? That's a fact. That's what he told me. He said, there's no way the truth will, you know, it will get out except those we witnesses who know what really happened. And that's why it's important to, you know, document on record what's, you know, what happened. Because yes, uh, as and to care, to care, to care about Lee Oswald and who he is. So, here, I'm I'm counting on you. That's all I can say. But here are the here I'm going to give you a list of people like you. You've got Gerald Posner and Vincent Bugliosi. These people have not told the truth. I've um, I know that. A lot of people say, well, look, you were examined by 60 minutes for 14 months, and they, then they decided not to film you. Well, they tried several times. They got stopped from people at, at the top, you know. You don't investigate people for 14 months and say that, that, that they're not telling the truth. Something else is going on. It was the longest investigation that 60 Minutes ever did was on my, on my case and my history. And they couldn't get it on the air. So, go figure. Media is controlled by the very same people that killed John F. Kennedy yes, and, and set up Lee and, you know, sent Jack Ruby to kill him. Same, same, very same people own the media. So it doesn't surprise me one bit. So I'm, um, if you have any other questions, let me know. But otherwise, we're uh, traced and super traced. I have to leave this the place where I'm located and go somewhere else after I talk to you. Yeah, the, uh, I was uh, did, I was about to ask you if if is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to make sure that we that gets out there. Well, basically, I just hope that uh, as I say, people see read the book and also read uh, uh, other books that can be trusted, like especially JFK and the uh, and the Unspeakable. To understand that JFK is being 
talk about demonization. They're trying to do everything. Because even if it comes out that the government did it, now what they're trying to do is show, well, who cares? Kennedy was a jerk anyway. So that way the people won't care. The people have got to start caring or they're going to go just like the frog. They're going to be boiled. Exactly. Judith, where can um, tell the listeners where they can um, see the uh, the videos again that you mentioned? Any okay. any blogs, your book, your websites? Plug anything that you want. Go ahead. Okay. Well, if you want to help me dir- directly, because uh, it gets really rough, especially in the winter, I have to keep living. You know, people can help if if they buy the book directly from my website at lee dash harvey dash oswald dot com. It's run by Joseph Hall, and he has books. And I have a book plate because I can't sign books. Imagine an author who can't do book signings. I can't go and to tell people on campus. I have to rely on people like you, Popeye. And it's very important what you're doing. I'm very proud of you for this. So, if you yeah, you can go to LeeHarveyOswald.com. That's Lee-Harvey-Oswald.com. And even then, it's really hard to get to us because. Even when you put that in, it's, it may be hard to find it. Then there's Judith Baker, J-U-D-Y-T-H, Baker, uh, blogspot.com. And that's run by Jim Fetzer. And I, I put materials there. You can buy the book directly from me there. Or you can do a donation. That would be terrific. Uh, that pays my medical bills and other things like that. You know, um, the YouTube has materials that it will also show us the books you can trust at the end of most of those YouTube presentations. That's Lola, number four, Lola, number four, JVB, number four, LHO. In other words, Lola for JVB for LHO on YouTube. That will can reach younger people. You'll also hear Chapter 15, uh, how I got involved with all of this, um, how the plot began uh, against Kennedy, uh, you'll read about it or hear about it because I'm reading actually from the book there. And I, of course, if people want to be my friend on Facebook, we get hacked all the time, but we keep going anyway. It's very hard because the hackers have removed. There's a friend button, and maybe they'll put it back on because I'm complaining. It, you can't find a way to become a friend of mine <laughs> on Facebook. People have to find a way to reach me somehow. And um, they do it usually by contacting another friend that's on Facebook who uh, invites them in. So on Facebook, I can talk to people under the messages part. And I'm asking people if they will send me soil. I've got soil now from 15 states. I'm trying to get them from all 50 states. That is, if they'll send um, the soil. Uh, I have a friend in Sweden who gets mail and sends it to me wherever I may be. And that's how we do it. Like souvenir of Indiana, say, you know, if it's marked souvenir and it's in a tight little bottle and sealed, it can pass. You know, so I, I, it's as close as I can get to my country now. I miss my country. I love my country. And I'm doing this for my people. Well, as I as a citizen and as a veteran, I thank you myself for having the courage to stand up, Judith. Thank you for facing, you know, the evils that you face and having the cojones to do it. I really appreciate it. And I know that, like I, I said to you, you know, and you know, through email, I know that Lee is looking at you from above and he's smiling. He's very proud of you. Well, I still dream of him, you know. And in fact, last night I dreamed that we kissed. <laughs> so I mean, he's in my heart all the time. Thank you very much, and I really need to get off the line now, and, and I have to catch a train. So, No problem. Thank you very much for doing this interview, Judith. It's been a pleasure, and if you ever need anything, uh, you know how to contact me. Okay. Bye-bye, Popeye. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Out and start to tell the truth about you know reality and about yeah. the government. They all of a sudden always end up getting cancer. Dr. Catherine Albrecht, she talks about the RFID chips. All of a sudden, she gets cancer. David Ray Griffin wrote like ten books on 9/11. He was sick. And I think it was cancer. So, do you think that the research that you guys were working on is being used today in a weaponized form? Well, as you know, I left that project due to to my concerns, my ethical concerns. And uh, before that, they blackballed me forever from being in cancer research. 
So I cannot determine precisely when or where the materials went after that, <laughs> except I know that some of them went to MD Anderson Hospital in Texas. We have um, later somebody filing a lawsuit that someone had tried to or injected them with cancer cells. Uh, ordinarily, this should not be any problem. The body would uh, take a cancer cell and destroy it in short order and filter it out and destroy it. Uh, you'd have to be injected with a lot of ordinary cancer cells in order to make a difference. But when you see a lawsuit that's been placed against someone, <laughs> you know, because uh, someone else injected them with cancer cells, you have to wonder if those were the same kind. These cells were un very unusual in six or seven days. Uh, they, If you inject injected them into a, in a compromised immune system, such as a newborn baby mouse, the tumors that would generate on that mouse would... Uh, be the same weight as the mouse itself in a week. So that's how fast it could grow. And they would take this and um, the biggest tumors, the most vigorous ones, and they'd put them through, run them through again and uh, put radiation on them and so on. And again, any tumors that grew even faster, those would be selected. That had been going on for a year. So you can imagine what we have today. We're talking, that was back in the 60s. Yeah, so, you know, fast forward 40 years, I can only imagine what you they've know, got today. You, you have no concept of what they have today and the genetic manipulations and so on. I'll just put it this way. I, wouldn't, I would not accept a vaccine for anything, especially if I were a controversial person. Yeah, I don't do vaccines. I, I When I was in the military, I personally had my own experience with vaccines after give, getting all the vaccines at boot camp. I developed Bell's palsy in the left side of my yeah. face for three months, and I still have. Hey, guys, welcome to the show. This is Popeye. It's down the rabbit hole. Today I have a special guest. Her name is Judith Barry Baker. You've all heard me talk about her many times. She is the real deal. She is 100% accurate with what she says, and her story doesn't get the airtime or the attention that it needs, and neither does the truth about Lee Harvey Oswald. So today, we're going to get into the truth, and we're gonna, you're going to get to hear Judah's story and the stuff that the media doesn't tell you about Lee. They try to make him a monster, but in all reality, Lee Oswald was not a monster. He was a really average everyday person just like you and me and he had a big heart and he was really a good person and that's the side of lee oswald that i want everybody to get to know so without further ado judith welcome to the show it is a pleasure to have you on thank you so much for doing this interview well i appreciate it popeye and it's because it's you that it's happening well you you are an amazing person and i i, I just you know i know that you, this really is uh, you can't do this. You can't do interviews on the uh, you know normally because your life has been put in danger because of the information that you have come forth with. So I, I appreciate that you you taking you know personal risk to speak to the audience and get your story and Lee's story out today. It, you have courage and you are uh, you are an example of what the people in this country should do. They, you know you, you you give you give me hope. So, and you give me, you know, it's, it's nice to see that people go through, you know, hell and still have the courage to stand up and speak truth to power. So you, you deserve a big thumbs up and, you know, a, a collective clap from the entire country for what you're doing. Well, I think that all started when I heard that Abraham Lincoln walked several miles to return a tiny bit of money. And it, it, that kind of thing has always been my hero. Just, you, you have to do what's right. Exactly. And... What's right in this case is getting your story out and the truth about Lee out. Um, you tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you got to meet Lee in New Orleans and, and kind of how you got to New Orleans. I understand. At that time, use whatever language was in my head. So I did that, and he answered me in Russian, said it wasn't a good idea to speak Russian in New Orleans. I was shocked. I mean, I never met anybody who who knew Russian, you know, and I was fascinated by the Russian culture. I I'd read all the Russian masters. I was also very good in chess. And uh, lo and behold, this man was the same. He he was a good chess player. 
not only had, did he know Russian and he knew all these wonderful uh, operas and by heart he knew the Queen of Spades opera, for example, by heart. He'd read Dostoevsky and Pushkin and so on. Not only that, he'd lived in Russia. You, can you imagine how I felt when I found out this man had lived in the USSR for almost three years? It didn't take a long period of time before I realized how very much I was attracted to him and what kind of a man he was. He was a very interesting and sensitive person uh, and a very brave man. He frankly ended up telling me that he was on a mission to try to kill Fidel Castro. He said I wasn't, he, when I uh, asked him uh, why he learned so many things about uh, Castro and about Cuba, he could rattle off he loved maps, and he he could rattle off every bit of Cuba from one end to the other, and all the rivers, and all the economic factors, and all of the leaders they had. And I asked him why he learned all that, and he said he was going to go to Cuba. I said why, and he said, well, he wasn't going to, there to give Castro a medal. So I understood immediately, of course, that he was what he was involved in, considering everything else he told me. That was intriguing. I realized I was speaking to someone who had been a spy in Russia and in the USSR. So anyway, that's basically how we met. And once you once you met him, he's the the, the guy that introduced you to um, David Ferry, correct? Uh, yeah. And uh, some of my enemies online, they they uh, I had approved. Uh, uh, one doctor's, uh, Dr. John Williams, is an outline of how all this happened, and he had placed a list of people under one day, uh, Ochsner and Ferry and so on. I didn't see them all that same day, but I certainly did see, meet Dr. David Ferry, so-called doctor, the day after Lee and I met in New Orleans. I met him on April 26th, and we're talking about April 27th, and uh, met him in the afternoon at a restaurant. That was quite an experience. Anybody who's ever seen Dave Ferry uh, would <clears throat> agree with me, <laughs> put it that way. Quite an outstanding person in many ways, brilliant man. Um, there, there's a biographer now, uh, you know, on the uh, Oswald Didditt side who contends that David Ferry wasn't an unusual man, but anybody who really knew Ferry would have had to disagree. This man never met Ferry, okay? So I, in fact, I'm writing a... Um, biographer David Ferry because I, I like him very much. Some people think, well, okay, he was a homosexual and he was a pedophile and all that. It's true that he had a real problem with um, teenage boys and there are a lot of people who condemn him for that. I, I look at the whole man, however, and see what else he was. He was a good patriot. He uh, pretended to dislike Kennedy. At one point, he, he really was... Uh, expressing hatred for Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs matter. But later, when he realized that it wasn't to Kennedy who was involved, that it was actually Nixon who had set up Bay of Pigs mess and so on, he realized what Kennedy had done. That changed everything for Ferry. And by the way, we have uh, Mary Sherman and David Ferry and me. So our joke was, you know, it was Dr. Mary, Dr. Ferry, and Dr. Ferry, <laughs> the three of us. Yes. Turned out they were working on a project, yeah, to... Uh, try and um, create a, they've been working on it for a year, try and create a kind of a virus-laden cancer that would react quite rapidly when injected in someone's body. And uh, they were going to develop it to, um, because it had lung cancer and uh, it would create lung cancer rapidly. Uh, and the idea was to try and kill Castro with it without that way involving any country. Nobody could be blamed get rid of cast or using what looked like natural means. I would suspect today that a number of people who suddenly come up with cancer, like maybe Mr. Chavez, it may not be as um, normal or natural as it may look. You just answered uh, my question, my next question, without even me needing to ask it, because I was about to ask you, do you think that these world leaders and truth tellers, people like Bill Hicks, Aaron Russo, all these other people that can understand how you got there, um, and you, for the listeners, you have to check out Judith's book. It's called Me and Lee. You can go see it at meandlee.com. And please, purchase the book. 
I, 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 like I said before on other shows, it's very important to get books and manuscripts and stuff like that because you are preserving history, and this is a definite piece of history that needs to be preserved. So uh, go ahead, Judith. Well, meeting Lee Oswald, I had no idea or concept, of course, of his existence or what, how important he would be in my life or anything like that. I was asked to come to New Orleans to assist uh, in um, Mary Sherman, Dr. Mary Sherman, and cancer research uh, work that she was doing. I was. Uh, my book explains the very complex uh, reasons why I went to New Orleans, and the fact that I had a a man in my life who was very interesting to me, and I thought I had lost my faith at that time in God. Thank God that that has been restored. Uh, I didn't believe that marriage was more than just a piece of paper, but you couldn't get birth control pills without it. Uh, this man had said, uh, he, you know, if I uh, would accept him, you know, and he would come and meet me in New Orleans and marry me. So I had a real exciting summer coming up and spring. And I arrived in April of 1963 in New Orleans, and it, it was a culture shock because being alone wasn't so bad, but Dr. Ochsner, who had invited me, and Dr. Mary Sherman, they were out of town because I had come two weeks early. There had been a miscommunication because my university got out, was on a trimester system that got out early. And I had nowhere to go, and I didn't want to go home. If you read the book, you'll see why. So I, when I arrived, uh, I, I, being someone who was uh, highly educated in certain areas and pretty much a dum-dum when it came to adjusting to a life um, in a place like New Orleans, I, I was really at a loss. And sooner, uh, sooner than later, I would have gotten myself into problems. Suddenly, this young man shows it up. I'm at the post office, and um, I drop something and briefly. And uh, when he picked it up, I thanked him in Russian, in a crude manner of speaking. Uh, I didn't know much Russian, but I liked 